Good morning, it's Reverend Mike Capron. We have a sermon this morning on Luke 24, 13 to 36. This is the story that happens on Easter Sunday itself. Um, Jesus is risen and two of his disciples, not the closest ones, um, are doing something that afternoon. And um, let's see what happens to them. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village they were, where they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So they went in and he stayed with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord is risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. This ends our reading. So today we're going to talk about Cleopas and friend. Just nod your heads like you know who I'm talking about. Cleopas and his nameless companion get only one appearance in the Bible. They are the people who meet Jesus on Easter Sunday on the famous walk to Emmaus. If you're only going to have one appearance in the Bible, this is a good one. We are talking this summer about stories and how you tell them. So let me tell you a really boring version of this story. Two guys, Cleopas and Sidekick, were wrong about some facts. They were wrong about Jesus. They thought he was going to kick out the Romans and save the nation. And they were wrong about Jesus again. The chief priest killed Jesus and now he was dead. End of story. Then they were wrong about who they were talking to. It was the risen Christ, but they didn't recognize him. So this is a story about them getting straight about the facts. They have been talking to Jesus all afternoon, which means that Jesus is alive again, and he really was the promised Messiah. They learned that when Jesus taught them about the scriptures on the road. And so at the end of the story, their errors have been corrected and they have the correct facts, the end. To me, that's really pretty boring. What is exciting, what happened in their hearts and spirits. 
So let's consider where they were when they started this story. They have lost their gladness and their joy. And beyond that, they've lost even their hopes. By the way, in this sermon, I'm going to be using some extended quotes from one of my favorite 19th century preachers, George H. Morrison. Let us first speak of gladness and joy. As Jesus came alongside them when they did not know it was him, he noticed their conversation and their sad faces devoid of joy. So long as Jesus had been alive, there was a great gladness in their hearts. Only to see him was like music to them, as it always is with anyone we love. His presence was the delight. There was a feeling of peace and security. When he was with them, all their cares and worries took wings and flew away. But now the Lord has passed away. It was like the passing of the sunshine for them. So as they walked together, they were sad. Worse yet, they have lost their hope. There was a time not so long ago when their hopes had been burning brightly like a star. They had trusted that Jesus was the one to redeem Israel. And they followed Jesus and saw his miracles. And that just had their hopes shining brighter and brighter. Surely this was the Christ, the son of the living God. Even the cross had not completely spoiled their hopes, for they remembered that he had talked of that. They remembered what he'd said, destroyed this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. But now on the third day, the sun was near setting, and darkness soon to fall upon the world. It was true that some women had come hurrying in, talking about the tomb being empty, but it was one thing to be told the tomb was empty, and quite another to believe that Christ was risen. And even the women confessed that they had not seen the Lord himself, but only an empty grave and a stone rolled away, and they had conversed with, what, angels? Clearly then, their master had not risen. They would never see him again, nor hear his words, nor follow him anymore. So here we are with Cleopas and his friend, and they have lost their joy, and they have lost their hope. But here is something amazing. These two have lost none of their desire. We know this because as they walked to a mass, all their talk was of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were animated, intense, and eager. They were talking loudly, the words flying from one to the other. For out of the fullness of heart, the mouth was speaking. Sometimes we do not know how much we loved someone or some place until we have lost them. Perhaps these two never understood how much they needed Jesus, how much they loved him until the day they thought he was gone. But now they knew it. And so on that dreary day, all their talk was of Jesus Christ. And the deepest desire of their hearts was this. Oh, that I knew where I might find him. Cue the entrance of the complete stranger who asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Exasperated. Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. And then this stranger walked alongside them and showed them the necessity of Jesus' death. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? You see, these two disciples had never really grasped the need that Christ should die. They had shared in the common hope that he would reign, but it was not a throne, but it was a throne they were dreaming of, not a cross. The stranger's next step was to lead them back to the word of God. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. One of the surest signs of the Spirit's presence is when suddenly the Bible lives again for us. Indeed, it is a living Christ who makes a living scripture. When he is going to reveal himself to us, passages we have known since we were children begin to live again and burn for us. Christ is absent that all the scholarship in the world would never make the Bible a living book. 
when old texts take a strange grip on us, when we hear the word in our spirits and we cannot silence them, when the promises come like music, when some great text we have long ignored reaches out its loving hand to us, well then the risen Savior is not far away. In some our hearts burn within us, and then and when that happens, then something or someone has lit the flame. So why are we talking about this passage today? We are in our summer series, which I call Narrating Your Story, meaning we are looking at Bible passages where one could interpret a situation in more than one way. What narrative will you choose? It's true that Cleopas and his friend learned some facts that corrected some wrong impressions that they had on that Easter Sunday. But as we said, narrating their story that way makes for a bland, boring story. It is also true that something really sad had happened to them, the death of their teacher and friend. We all experience loss and grief. One can tell about a compelling story about wrestling with such things. But that is not the story of the walk to a man. It is also true that their hopes had been dashed. They had one vision of the future in mind and it was not going to come true. One can tell stories about the disappointment of dashed hopes, but that is also not the story of the walk to a man's because the reality they encounter on the road was much better than the one they've hoped for. I'll tell you a bit of trivia I learned while preparing this sermon. Most names mean something, and the name Cleopas means slow. So this man named Slow was foolish and slow to believe. He needed to have his eyes opened. The same verb as when Jesus opens the scriptures to them. But he got it in the end. And that is how I am narrating this story today because he was also slow to give up his desire for Christ. Our strengths are also our weaknesses. Cleopas took his time coming to conclusions, and I resonate with that. But he got there in the end, when Jesus broke the bread, when he realized that his heart had been burning for hours. He just hadn't noticed it. I suspect that can and has happened to us too. And as I turn to the question of how we will narrate our own story, how will we narrate our story as a church? I have not lost my joy in being with you and worshiping with you. Like you, I have some disappointment that my dreams and hopes for the future do not match the reality that we face. No one goes to seminary hoping to help close a church. And I certainly didn't take your, my, this call as your pastor with that in mind as a goal. But here we are, walking along the road together, trying to figure out where Jesus is in the midst of this. Honestly, I believe he is right here, somewhere close by, even if we are momentarily kept from recognizing him. Wherever two or three are gathered, he is here. And one of the things I love about this community of faith is that we have lost none of our desire for Jesus. That is so key. I am reminded of a way that our forebearers in First Presbyterian Elmwood Park narrated their story 60, 70, 80 years ago. They faced problems and realities and responded to them as best they could, just as we are. If you read the history of this church, you notice that they had a mantra, a motto, a watchword. Jesus never fails. Like them, I believe that. Jesus never fails. There are griefs, there are setbacks, there are disappointments, but Jesus never fails. We may be a bit slow to recognize Jesus and what he is really up to, but you can take this to the bank. Jesus never fails. It is true whether you are in Jerusalem or Emmaus or Elmwood Park or somewhere else, Jesus never fails. Not only does he never fail, but he's always around, even if you aren't quite sure where. I take great comfort in that, and I hope you do as well.
God bless. Amen.